I was born in 1976 in London. My parents were living in Africa, in Nigeria, and my mom wanted to come back to Lebanon to give birth to me, but the civil war had just started. The airports were closed because they were blown up, so she, uh, she went to London instead. It was a long civil war, about 20 years, and very brutal and very bloody and very disgusting. I started university here. I studied graphic design because at the time, after the war, there was no fine arts program in the college I was going to because during the war they cut out all the programs that they thought was unnecessary for survival <laughs> and of course art and music were on that list. What it means to be an artist in Lebanon, it's very difficult because there's no support, no funding. Society has very wrong impression of you. Like they think you're a slacker or a druggie or a, someone who can't make it in life. <laughs> So it's really cutting edge, <laughs> you know, it's really far out. Many people have come through Lebanon. It's the crossroad between East and West. Today, if you dig in Beirut, for example, where we were just driving, you can see layers and layers of, of history just beneath your feet. So that's what I mean when we say there are, there are seven cities that exist under Beirut. So we can start architecturally. It's the first thing you see is extremely modern buildings next to very old ones. So just visually looking at the city, you have a juxtaposition of so many architectural styles, so many different building materials. There's no homogeneous look, it's quite chaotic. And so it's quite schizophrenic in that way. Then if we go on a deeper level, the people. <laughs> we have 18 different religious sects living in Lebanon, practicing freely and openly recognized. Somehow we found a way to manage to live side by side. When I first moved to Lebanon, I was 18 and I never even thought of myself as a woman. I was just Zena. But then coming here, there's a big separation between male and female, and especially in post-war situation. You know, there isn't a lot of integration like the way there is today. And so I became extremely aware of my identity as a woman, which never existed before. One of the earliest performances I did was on Hamra Street, which is the main street in, in downtown Beirut. It's very cosmopolitan. There's a lot of shops and restaurants, um, even in post-war. So I took one of these mannequins that are in the shop windows that are always either wearing bridal dresses or fancy evening wear.
and instead I dressed her up to look like me, which was baggy torn jeans, a white t-shirt, and a baseball cap. And I used to wear my baseball cap backwards, so I really looked like a boy. So I dressed her up in my clothes and I walked around the streets because I wanted a friend who was like me. <laughs> because I couldn't relate to the women in Lebanon at the time. We had very, very different backgrounds. Uh, they were more, you know, stay at home, be quiet, domestic. Also living in a post-war country, a woman on my own. I, I felt safer looking, feeling and acting like a man. And of course, at that time, I thought it was, you know, being a woman was a sign of weakness. There's a tradition in our country where women will come to your house to check you out for their sons. I call it the meat market. <laughs> and I thought this could be a great project. And then I came up with a project, which was called Wahad Aris Please, which means a husband please. I got a wedding dress. I spray painted it pink and I participated in the first Beirut Marathon and I basically ran around looking for a husband. <laughs> I was taking back the power. So instead of them coming to my house, I'm just gonna go check them out and see like who I want. Most people, when they talk about marriage, it always goes back to something financial. Either the guys would say, yeah, I'm waiting to save up money. Or the girls would say, yeah, I need someone to take care of me. And then I would say, well, what about love? What about passion, romance? We are the bubblegum culture, like born in the 70s raised in the 80s where consumerism was considered God. After a country has gone through 20 years of bloody massacre, it's very hard to say, to make a painting about war because nobody wants to see it or even think about it. But if you can do it in a way that is humorous, that provokes, then you have a, a, a chance to get the message across while capturing people's attention and hearts. The idea was to kind of uh, subdue the macho, macho man and transform violence into love, transform pain into joy. You know, people would immediately write off my work as kitsch, but I always said it's not kitsch, it's political pop. I used to use the color pink a lot in my work because to me, pink was the color that represents my generation, which is a generation that grew up with consumerism and capitalism as the greatest values that man could aspire to have. Pink to me, it's quick, it's artificial, it's like bubble gum. You chew it and then you spit it out. It has no value in your nutrition system, has no value in your emotional life. It's quick and superficial. And so I felt like it was a good color to represent this bubblegum culture. It was my little way of fighting through ultra feminism, through ultra girly girly, through you know the most sweetest and subtle side of, of being a woman. The men in this part of the world need even more help than the women because they are the ones who are constantly facing frustration, humiliation. What if you don't want to carry a gun? What if you don't want to be this macho macho man? What if you don't want to fight? What if you don't want to shout or yell? What if you don't want to hit people? 
What if you don't believe in aggression? It was a normal summer day. It was early in the morning. I was walking on the street. My friend calls me and she says, go back home, they've blown up the airport. And I remember joking with her on the phone saying, it's gonna be fine, everything's gonna be okay tomorrow. And she said, no, this is serious, go back home. So began the 33-day Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the most brutal 33 days of my life. Within one month, they turned the clock back on Beirut 20 years. We were back into the Civil War stage. Highways, roads, bridges were blown up so nobody could leave or enter. They blew up the airport so no one could fly out. They carpet bombed the entire south of Beirut. The noise, the sound of bombs, it's louder than anything you can ever imagine. It's the loudest thing. Your house shakes, your bones shake, and you hear it coming and you don't know where it's gonna land. One of the worst things that happened during the war was the Israeli army blew up our fuel reserves. So all the oil spilled into the Mediterranean. It was the biggest oil spill of the Eastern Mediterranean ever. 15,000 tons of oil spilled in the water. And of course, we couldn't leave the house. We couldn't go to the beach. We couldn't do anything. At least we documented the spill. A few of us headed the efforts to clean up the oil spill, and we had internationals come in and help with that. But it was, it was a lost cause. It was already five weeks since the oil was in the water. And so till today, I don't swim in our sea anymore because I remember, like I was there, I saw the oil. Many people never even saw it. They don't know because it sank to the bottom. So I wrote an email to all my friends because I thought I was going to die that night. And I wrote all night describing the events, the bombs, what I was hearing, what I was feeling. And just as dawn was breaking, I sent it off. And I sent it to every single person on my address book. Everyone, I wanted them to know how and why I was going to die. I didn't want to be a nameless victim. It's the most disgusting feeling because in that moment, you feel like a victim where you have no control over what's happening to you and your life and no say. And you realize at that moment how small and petty the human race can be. With war, you lose your humanity. You cease to become a human. When I woke up, my inbox was flooded with responses. Zaina, please keep writing. We're not hearing anything. We have no idea what's going on. Then a friend of mine in the States at the time came up with a brilliant idea. He said, why don't you blog? And that's it. And then I directed the media to there and I said, just take it. So it was beirutupdate.blogspot.com. Early on, the Guardian newspaper contacted me. CNN contacted me, BBC contacted me, and then I became what we call today a citizen journalist. From artist to citizen journalist. I went with, um, with Maya, my best friend, to the supermarket once. Maya at the time was going through chemotherapy, so 
She was tired. She had no hair, you know, wearing a scarf. We were going to get some food or something. There was nothing left. And I remember once I had so much pasta to cook, but there was no water. So we contemplated, can we cook pasta and beer? <laughs> Two months after the war ended, Maya passed away. And so I went through another war on an emotional level, even a physical level. I, a huge part of me died with her that till today I never recovered from because she was my soulmate. She was the closest person to me. Then one night I had a dream and she came to me in this dream. It was so real. I hugged her. It was so real. In a way, I was reborn. I sat down and I started writing the dream. I didn't want to forget it. And then I started writing other things about us and her. And the writing is what healed me. It's, it helped a lot. And so I started writing about the present, I started writing about the past, I went back, back, back to when we first moved to Lebanon and when I first met Maya. And then I went back to a lifetime before that and a lifetime before that because I felt like the common thread in the book was the cycle of violence that keeps repeating. Everything I loved was systematically taken away from me. But two years later, the book was born. When I wrote the book, nobody really knew what I was writing about. I was very private because it was my healing process. There were a lot of, of stories in the book that, you know, girls don't discuss in public. Several times I was molested on the street. This was right after the Civil War. There was a lot of sexual tension with men in the country. And it was very common for a woman to be grabbed. It's the most humiliating thing and it's very hard for a young Arab woman to discuss. Losing my virginity. There was no one I could talk to about it. You're not supposed to have sex before marriage. This caused a big problem with my family. For their daughter to come out like this was a big blow for them. I was very scared to even publish this book, but there was a burning desire inside that said, I have to do it, I have to do it. Truth is the most important thing in my life, even if it gets me into trouble. The consequences were tough. I also received a lot of death threats. My mom read the book. She had to go to hospital because she had a panic attack that was so strong she thought she was dying. She begged me to take the book off the shelves. She was so worried about my father reading it. She thought it would break his heart. Eventually, my father did read the book and I, I think I'm the luckiest Arab woman ever because he was actually very supportive. He said, I don't agree with much of what you've written, but I respect that you made a commitment to write a book and you wrote it and you finished it and it's been published by a reputable publisher. And that takes a lot of courage and determination. But I decided then and there that I would not have it translated into Arabic. I never really went back to the kind of art I was making back then. Something was off. A couple years later, I had this big kind of inner transformation. And that's when it was even more clear that this type of art is not part of this path. It's done. And then it took a few years later to develop the new kind of painting that I'm doing now. And this painting, is very much about being outdoors. It's very much about connecting to the higher source, about expression and abstraction in the most
pure and truthful form that I can do. Then I started going to the south of Lebanon, which is where I'm from. It's a very special and powerful land. It was occupied by the Israeli army for over 20 years. And so I only went home for the first time in the year 2000. I wanted to go home. I wanted to work in the one area in Lebanon that I felt was the most violent, that endured the most pain. And so, of course, it was Khiam prison that once used to be a torture center, concentration camp in South Lebanon, built by the Israeli army, coordinated with the South Lebanese army who were conspiring with the Israeli army. So I went down to the prison, which is now a museum, after the liberation of the south of Lebanon in the year 2000. I had to get special permission to work there. And then they allowed me to come in. do my meditation, do the paintings. And then when I was finished, I left behind two little mantras that I usually keep. They either say love, forgiveness, or compassion. So in Khiam, I left love and forgiveness. Uh, I didn't think they would keep it. I also spent a lot of time in my mom's village. And I cut so much that there was barely anything left of my old life. Friends, relationships, husbands, all gone. Then one day, I went out to an abandoned house, which was very close to where my mom's house was blown up in the 80s, because I was investigating this concept of home. I don't have a home. Where is home? Both my house, my parents' houses were blown up or occupied, or massacres happened in them, tortures. Where is home? And then, so one day I was, I went into one of these abandoned houses and I started thinking about what happens to a space when people leave it, a home that became abandoned. What about the energy in the house? The house perceived so much and experienced so much. Joy in a family, death in a family, cooking, love making. And then when these humans leave, what happens to the space? to transform that space, remove the negative, or what we call in yogic terms, tamasic, dark energy, and replace it with sattvic, or positive energy. I do a meditation to ask for forgiveness for the people who did this, because oftentimes, they had no idea what they were doing. And then I proceed to burn objects from that area, a form of purification. I take the ashes of these and I create an ink, a special black ink that's made from the ashes. And then from this ink, I create paintings on site. And these paintings are what I call energetic imprints.
reality of being a full-time artist is that you're constantly, constantly working. Your mind and your heart is constantly sifting through life, information, colors, ideas, and you're in a constant mode of creation which needs to be nourished and fed. And there has to be discipline for work to be made. It was in my DNA before I could even walk. I don't even think of it as a choice or a decision that I made. It is a calling, and it's a calling from a higher source because why else would you do something that is the most difficult career you can have? Completely unstable, economically completely unreliable, uh, socially completely alienating. It's not a pleasant profession. I've passed through different periods in my life and I'm definitely in a new phase of life, not making uh, ironic or provocative work anymore. There's softness, there's a lot of softness, there's a lot of love. There's a deep, a deep love. I have new muses of inspiration that are informing my work.